On this episode, we drop in on a Vokes March in Oregon. Then we head to Colorado and the Congress for the New Urbanism. We look at a pedestrian study of Colorado Boulevard. Another study shows that narrow streets have fewer accidents. Landscaping for a parking garage in Virginia is hostile to pedestrians. And finally, we find out how Stanford University reduced the demand for parking. Stay tuned. We're in Portland, Oregon, talking with Wendy Bumgardner, who's secretary of the American Volksport Association. What is the American Volksport Association? We're an association of over 500 walking clubs nationwide. We host non-competitive walking events. They're 10 kilometers long, and they're open to everyone to come and enjoy as a public service. You have one going on here today. What's special about this one? Well, this is a special walk to remember one of our Volkswalkers, Norm Lieb, who was very active with us and who is no longer with us, but we're celebrating his life by getting out and enjoying a wonderful walk up beautiful Pal Butte. And it's a little bit of light rain and drizzle today. That doesn't seem to bother anybody. Uh, not a problem. We have warnings out about the mud up on the trail, but we're all ready. We've got our hiking boots on, and we're just going to have a great day. You're also known as the Web Sarina of Walking. Why is that? Well, I have a couple of great walking sites on the Internet. One is our American Volksport Association site, www.ava.org. And the other one is my mining company site, which is walking.miningco.com. And there I have weekly articles about all different sorts of walking, uh, also, we have a chat room, we have a newsletter, and a bulletin board, and links to hundreds of other walking sites around the Internet. So, what, what sort of things do you talk about on something like that? What are people looking for when they surf the net and come across your site? Well, the biggest thing to look for is shoes. <laughs> They're all very interested in different types of shoes, different types of gear that they can wear, and also how to get started on a walking program. People have been told that it's time for them to get out, get off the couch, and start walking, and they want to know, how do I do that? How far should I walk? How fast should I walk? Uh, walking for weight loss. What's the best amount to do for walking for weight loss? What's the best speed? Uh, things like that. We're in Denver talking with Stephanos Palizoides, who's one of the directors of the Congress for the New Urbanism. What is the Congress for the New Urbanism? Well, the Congress is an is a organization that's set up to uh, further the goal of changing the growth pattern of, uh, of the United States, the means by which the country develops and, and grows, both internally in making more coherent and beautiful and livable cities, and in the process of doing that, generating a, a conservation, preservation, higher enhancement and enjoyment of the landscape. What are some of the problems with the way things have been done, and, and what are the solutions you have to, to improve upon that? Well, what, what has actually been done to date is that, is that uh, for a long period of time, probably a series of generations, people have been living center cities and hoping to, uh, to find nature in, on the edge of the city. But suburbanization has been a process by which the first few people who move to the suburbs end up enjoying them. And when the full measure of the number of people who are going out there f uh, reached its full number, uh, its full force, uh, nature was trampled and disappeared. And the very reason for being out there uh, disappeared. So we've lived through probably 70 or 80 years of an increasing city edge, uh, more and more people going further and further out to find nature in vain, may I add, while at the same time the center city gets depopulated, disinvested, and abandoned. Uh, and the result is all the, the, the complex problematics of where we are today. Uh, poor people living in the city, away from jobs who are on the edge, people who live in the edge who are disconnected from, from nature as much as they were before, but also people who live in the edge who don't have uh, the, the social and the, and the institutional support that gives them full and, and, and enjoyable lives. So the new urbanism is seeking to, to, to uh, change the rules that are applied by the public sector in our country and to empower through design the private sector to both strengthen the center city by designing uh, more coherently and beautifully in neighborhoods and in districts and in corridors and um, preserving uh, as much of nature as possible and building in a more measured manner towns or fragments of towns in 
the suburbs and not tracts or places of, of anonymity and, and the places that in their realization end up denying the reason uh, why they should be there in the first place. So we're after both uh, a sense of greater permanence in, in the landscape and in the city and, and, a, and a sense of greater balance between the two. Just finishing up uh, your sixth annual conference, four days here in Denver, uh, what have people been talking about? Well, there have been already four congresses. The first four were foundation congresses. The fifth and the sixth, last year's and this year's, were about topical issues. And the topical issue this year had to do with the reorientation and the rededication of the Congress to issues of infilling, building in existing contexts, and building, uh, regenerating and building in, in concert with nature. And those are two very important ideas, particularly because uh, most people's perception of the new urbanism is as, as a kind of uh, a building of, on, on, on the edge. And in fact, in our country, there's been a tremendous pro amount of progress made, as, as exemplified by the beautiful buildings and the beautiful places that are surrounding us here in downtown Denver. There's been a great progress made in the process of people reclaiming existing uh, existing places of human habitation in this country. And the reason why this is important is not only from an architectural point of view or a social point of view, but also from an economic point of view. Because in fact the kinds of investments that existing cities uh, pre represent, which are in the billions and trillions of dollars, depending on, on their size, cannot be repeated and, 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 and would be grossly wasted if we did not move back and, and reclaim them and work with them to make better places for, for, uh, for our children and for our children's children. And this year you had a joint session with the Urban Land Institute. Yes. What was the importance of that? Well, the importance of that, I think, is that we're being noticed as having an effect. Uh, the, the, the ideas of, of uh, uh, the ideas of sprawl have been fueled to, ex to a great extent by, by much of the practice of the Urban Lands Institute. But I think there's a reformist wing within the, within the, the Institute that really feels that the new urbanism has merit and importance to the future of the country. Uh, some people think we are a niche market uh, within the Institute. We think we are uh, the future of the country. Uh, we don't see ourselves in economic terms, we see ourselves also in social and physical terms. We think that there is the, the, the process of reconstruction are full of options for, for people to exercise as developers or as, or as, or as citizens um, cannot, be, cannot be carried out in this kind of mindless, carb-based, carb uh, separated land use, sprawled over the landscape, nature-destroying process that development has been over the last, uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so. so the, 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 the dialogue with the ULI is, is the process of coming, of, of coming to terms, mostly by them, I think, about what the new urbanism represents and how it is, coming to, it is getting to become the, the dominant way of, of building uh, beautiful and prosperous places in this country. Where's next year's conference? And have people decided what we're going to have to talk about then? Well, um, the, the, the new urbanism is driven primarily by, by results. This is an important thing to know. Uh, so the next conference is in Milwaukee. And despite uh, the fact that people believe in, in, in a lot of things in the new urbanism, it is really what we leave behind and what we do that really matters. So next year's conference is organized by two developers, you can believe that. Uh, they're, they're the co-chairs of the conference, which is quite astounding, uh, considering the beginnings of this movement, which was purely in design. And it is about the economy of cities. It is about the, the economic advantage that cities offer by location, by their mix of the population, by their social diversity, and by the existing investment in place over, 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 over centuries in many instances in this country uh, to, to uh, provide richer places for people to live and richer places for people to be wealthy and to enjoy in their leisure both their families and the results of their labor. And uh, it is going to be a fascinating, um, a fascinating uh, shift away from issues of pure design into issues of the consequences of the results of design on the population at large. We're in Denver talking with Robin Mayhew, who's Director of Transportation Solutions. What is Transportation Solutions? Transportation Solutions is a transportation management association. It's part of the Cherry Creek Chamber of Commerce. It's brought together with a public-private group of stakeholders interested in um, increasing and enhancing the mobility through a um, sub-area of Denver. And go ahead. 
Now you just did a study as part of your uh, mission on Colorado Boulevard. Correct. What prompted the study and what did you look at? Yes. We looked at the um, number of employees and customers and residents that walk along an area that is a six-lane six uh, stretch of highway and it's actually uh, the home of the most highly congested intersection in the state and uh, we looked at it in terms of its pedestrian and uh, transit friendly um, characteristics, land use characteristics. We walked a three-mile stretch of this Colorado Boulevard and documented uh, mobility issues in terms of uh, different characteristics and we identified actually a, a number of things to work on. It's nothing like actually getting out and walking to see what pedestrians face. What sort of things did you come up with? Uh, well we came up with, we identified nine issues and if I might I'll just read off what those were and a number of related strategies. Uh, street light and utility poles that were um, blocking pedestrian access in the right in the middle of the sidewalks bus stop locations that were uh, either in an area where there wasn't even a paved surface or there um, were a number of obstacles bus benches that were too close to the curb we identified areas where there were bus benches that were right up against the curb more as an advertisement than for an actual bench for sitting and also we decided if it was if you could straighten out your legs and you're in the middle of traffic it was a little too close uh, we noticed that although this is one of the main arterials for um, RTD the regional transportation district bus system in our area there were only two bus shelters along the the entire three mile stretch of our focus um, we noted that there were uh, many missing ADA curb ramps we identified 22 intersections um, crosswalks. We looked at crosswalks and, and noted where there were uh, medians that could be elevated to provide a safe haven for pedestrians. And secondly, where restriping of the walkway would help to um, denote where the pedestrian should be walking. Uh, sidewalk obstructions, there were a number of obstacles including shrubs and sign poles that were just in the middle of sidewalks. Uh, pedestrian access, a lot of times uh, through a uh, parking lot, there, there was no clear way to um, walk across from the street to the front of the businesses and uh, we identified ways that that could be enhanced. And lastly, we, we work with several different uh, organizations and, and governments and we are um, helping to better coordinate all of their efforts. So those were the nine different things that we identified. And once you identified what the problems were, what's the process then for, for getting solutions to the problems? Yes. Well, uh, I'll give you an example. The ADA curb ramps that we identified, uh, we went back then and looked at how can we fix this, and we identified a pot of money within the, the Denver um, Capital Improvement Program. And uh, we have in line now 22 ADA curb ramp installation for next year, the capital improvement program within Denver for next year. We're also working with property owners. For instance, uh, if there's a sign pole that is in the middle of the sidewalk, we can, um, or excuse me, a utility pole, the uh, local public service will move it for free if the TMA can get an easement from the property owner. So we're coordinating um, with the property owners and the, uh, the governments and the public service on that particular one. One other thing we're, that we're doing is um, through the Federal Transportation Improvement Program and the Denver Regional Council of Governments, every two years there's a cycle of, of federal dollars available, but you have to document the need. And through the study, we've documented the need for sidewalks um, along a lot of this uh, stretch. and. Uh, where they were not um, accessible, we are actually going to put in sidewalks and un underground the electrical wiring so that with that's part of, uh, again, the Denver Capital Improvement Program. And we are going to match that up with federal dollars so that we'll enhance mobility and get, get rid of the obstructions. And one other thing is that we are working on uh, 
bike path access, there's a bike path that actually intercepts, intersects the Colorado Boulevard, and we um, at, we put in with the city of Glendale for a, another TIP application, total of five, based on the documentation of this particular project, uh, to access part of Colorado Boulevard that currently wasn't accessible, the bike path went underneath, and then also a pedestrian bridge that exists doesn't have a very good interface with a large um, business. Um, there's a um, campus of several different businesses that are right across the street from a pedestrian bridge and a walkover and we've uh, got a pedestrian um, facility that we're going to put in also as part of this TIP process. So, so how important was it to document the problems and document the need before you could actually fix the problems? Well, we found that by, by spending the time walking the, the Colorado Boulevard and um, taking pictures and documenting the issues one by one, it turned this into a uh, immensely successful project. It, it's keeping me busy. I'm going to have a lot of work ahead of me in terms of getting the easements from property owners. And it was not a very expensive project project it cost thirty thousand dollars actually we, st we started it in October and by January we were completed the we completed the inventory part of it and now we're moving on and and uh, I'd say we've we've identified about two million dollars already to go into the Colorado Boulevard as a result of this we're talking with Peter Swift of Swift and Associates what is Swift & Associates? A planning and civil engineering firm in Longmont, Colorado. Recently you took a look at the relationship between uh, road widths and accidents in Longmont. What got you interested in doing that study? We were the principal planners and civil engineers for traditional neighborhood development, a new urbanist project in Longmont. And we went through a whole series of exceptions to zoning regulations, engineering standards, for months and years, in fact. And by the time we got done with that, the last, the uh, outstanding request for exemption we had was a street width. And the developer was so tired of the battle at that point that he threw up his hands and said, let's just build standard streets. Well, I did a, a brief search of the literature to find that no one has really evaluated the safety of wider or narrower, narrower streets, and that the argument apparently was working with opinions more than factual data to a certain extent. So that uh, had me very interested in hiring an intern and conducting a study. So what did you look at in the study and what did you conclude? Uh, we didn't want to restrict it to simply the number of injury accidents versus street widths. We wanted to take other factors into account to see if there were other correlations. We evaluated whether there, the site distance was obstructed at intersections where the accidents occurred. We looked at uh, different parameters of what kind of curbs, whether trees existed on the street, the location of the closest traffic uh, signal or traffic control device. We looked at building types, land uses, and, me and several other parameters, of course, including whether the street curved and the street width. The two, the only of the, only two of those 13 parameters had statistical significance. Uh, the least of that two was whether the street curved or not. Straight streets are more dangerous, apparently. And the other one had a very strong statistical correlation, which was street width. Our safest street width is 24 feet wide, according to this study, and there's a 400% increase in injury accidents from a 30-foot to a 36-foot wide street. So why don't we see more 24-foot streets then? Traffic engineering for the last 70 years has been primarily concerned with moving vehicles at the, at, at the most expedient, quickest route possible from points A to points B. Um, traffic engineers are more concerned, I think, about that element than what we are now seeing as a public safety issue. It's interesting to note that there are actual national design documents, like uh, Ashto's Green Book, a policy on geometric design, that recommend skittier streets and recommend the, uh, that it's safer for cars to slow down, to pass each other with parking on these types of streets. But out of that thousand-page document the traffic engineers have been using for years, those three pages that talk about skinny streets have been summarily discounted. I don't know why, to answer your question. <laughs> what, uh, and this is the first study of its kind that you're familiar with, 
What sort of research would you like to see people do in the future to, to build on this? I think one of the most important things is for people to conduct surveys according to a, the same approach that we've used so that we can start building a correlative database here to see if from one city to another, from one region to another in the country, we're able to see this same type of trend. Uh, again, this is the first of its type that I'm aware of. There may be something out, else out there. But we need a base of these studies to really begin to formulate an appropriate public safety policy. The second thing is I think we really need to look very closely at the trade-off with fire injuries versus vehicular or pedestrian accident injuries. There's a significantly greater number of accidents on wide streets than there are fire injuries within those same neighborhoods and within the same time period we've discovered. So in terms of fire uh, emergency response through skinny streets, I think that our elected officials really need to take a stand and look globally at public safety issues so that it has an overall net benefit to the public. Every now and then you come across something that's totally unexplainable. We're in Tyson's Corner, Virginia a highly developed area that's not known for being pedestrian friendly. We're along Gallows Road. You can see behind me where there's a little space between the street and a parking garage where there should be a sidewalk. But there isn't. Instead, there's a little hill and some shrubbery. A pedestrian has to be a mountain goat to make their way along that hill. A lot of pedestrians do. There's a well-worn trail. We think people could do better. For a free pedestrian action kit, write to The Campaign to Make America Walkable, care of the Bicycle Federation of America, 1506 21st Street Northwest, Suite 200, Washington, D.C., 20036. We're in Palo Alto on the campus of Stanford University, talking with Patrick Sigmund. Years ago when you were a student here, you did your senior thesis on parking. How did you get interested in that and what did you conclude about it? <laughs> right. Uh, Stanford began a building boom and they began building huge parking structures. And I looked at them and realized they couldn't possibly be paying for themselves and that they must be tremendously expensive. What I concluded is they cost about $150 a month per space to build and there were a lot cheaper ways out there to get people to work. Um, essentially what we found is it's it's cheaper to pay people not to drive than to put up parking structures. And so the tendency has been to basically give away the parking but people had to pay for any alternative that they wanted. Right, right. Stanford, unlike most employers, does charge a small fee for parking, but essentially we were charging people $7 a month to drive. It was costing us over $150 a month to put up parking structures, or even with the cost of land around here and, and the value of land, um, it's about that much to build a surface lot and uh, run some shuttles to it. So we essentially said, let's take that money and let's put it into creating alternatives for people and into paying people not to drive. So what sort of alternatives did you come up with? Stanford is fortunately a couple miles from from the nearest train station. I mean at least there's one there unlike in some places. Um, we took a little commute hour shuttle began running it as a free all-day transit system. We took our bicycle budget from about five thousand dollars worth of bike racks to about eight hundred thousand dollars a year worth of bike lanes and lockers and showers uh, and a full-time bike program manager to help people figure out how to commute by bike. Um, we also just started paying people. Uh, it's only a small program, it's about ninety dollars a year, um, but just that amount does two things. First, it actually does motivate people. Second, it puts the official blessing that yes, it's okay to be somebody who doesn't drive. We, we support you. Um, it's, it's our way of making up for that, that steady bombardment of 
ads and commercials to get you to go out and buy a car, a new car, and drive it to work. So uh, and there's been a lot of, lot of growth at Stanford lately. Has this uh, cash out on parking been successful in, in controlling the parking and traffic? It's, it's worked pretty dramatically. Um, Stanford negotiated the deal which said we could expand the campus by 25 percent. It's about two million square feet um, of medical center expansion, science and engineering facilities, computer buildings, as long as we didn't add any more traffic to the nearby roads. And by this mix of, of paying people not to drive, better alternatives, and also some building housing on campus, we've stuck to that bargain for about 10 years. Um, what it's meant for us is that we get along much better with the neighboring communities. And on the other hand, we don't have to pour huge amounts into building parking structures. And we don't have to ruin the beauty of the campus with wave upon wave of, of parking lots. So you hit on the two problems. Uh, parking's expensive, and when you provide it for free, you get a lot of traffic, which is sometimes what the neighbors object to. It's not the development. It's the traffic gen it generates. Right. It's, it's something where, on the one hand, the, the neighbors want to see plenty of parking built, because otherwise people will come park on their street, they figure. On the other hand, they hate the traffic. And the problem is that just providing free parking as a reward for driving and nothing to people who don't drive turns out to be a recipe for high traffic. So when you even things out, when you start paying people not to drive, then you get a really dramatic reduction. The, the, the studies, and they've been done all around the country now, pretty well say that if you pay people 60 bucks a month not to drive, you'll reduce your parking demand and your traffic by somewhere on the order of 15 to 30 percent. So 60 bucks a month buys you a 15 to 30 percent reduction in parking demand. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.